we'll move on to the second session of this seminar. Uh, Professor Alan Zelak currently works uh, at the Department of Civil Procedure in the Faculty of Law at the University of Cyber. Uh, who will present to us a paper about new age, old issues, taking of evidence between paternalistic, inquisitorialism, and passive communities. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Um, as you said, we are starting with a delay, and I would like to, with your permission, to stand up uh, to see you better and to have this uh, outside pressure on me to speak uh, shorter, because I see that discussion here is very important. Uh, my uh, first introductory remark is that um, I really appreciate uh, being here and think that uh, Girona has established itself as a very exciting place uh, and the chair for uh, legal culture is currently a very, well, I would say a vibrant place which is noted in uh, different sides of Europe and the world and I'm therefore very glad to be in this um, uh, also exciting project of establishing a new journal and my thanks go in particular to Jordi and to Edgar as those who are most uh, uh, responsible for making it possible. Uh, now again all of my presentations here need to have a disclaimer and I'm going to repeat it once again. Uh, my main area of um, expertise and research is uh, civil procedure. Um, I see many of you being active in the area of criminal justice. Uh, however, my firm belief is uh, uh, that uh, civil procedure, criminal procedure, administrative procedure, when it comes to common issues like evidence, do share and uh, do have a lot in common, although we always need to take into account their uh, special uh, needs and special uh, views, but uh, generally I hope this is going to be relevant. And uh, well, um, when I was invited to, to speak here, uh, I found inspiration in, in two things. First of all, I will tell you a little bit about another exciting project to which Renko and I were a part of in the past five years, and therefore I wanted to connect our work in one area with uh, uh, my uh, appearance here. And the second inspiration uh, that I had for my speech today uh, was actually the uh, very successful conference which was held in Girona uh, last, uh, was it June? Yeah, I think it was in, in June 2018, uh, where the first uh, lecture was uh, uh, provided again, to my great satisfaction, but by a civil proceduralist, uh, namely Adrian Zuckerman from Oxford, and I was very much uh, eager to listen to him and when I have heard his uh, uh, speech, I thought, well, uh, I disagree with so many things in this uh, speech that I think I should at some time say or write something about it. So you will see whether it's relevant or, or not uh, a little bit later in my, in my speech. But uh, Paul, in the end of his presentation, stated that uh, all our discussions are in the end as much as important as they have a bearing on the real life of law and as much as they have some influence on, on legal practice. So I'm going to uh, start where Paul ended and I'm going to place my discussion in the context of, uh, well I see, new age and old issues of something that has been important both in the old age and nowadays, and this is uh, the uh, uh, idea that legal system needs to be improved and that uh, it needs to be uh, reformed. And, uh, well, what were seen to be the principal threats to contemporary justice systems, and civil justice is in particular what I had in mind, but I think it applies at least partially to, to, to criminal justice as well. Uh, in the second half of at the 20th century or at the end of 80s and in the 90s, I think that uh, the best summary was given by uh, an English colleague, a member of the International Association of Procedural Law, but also an English lord, uh, Jack Jacob, who in several of his speeches referred to a three-headed uh, three hydra, 
I, I see that we have Hydra for the second time, then we had many heads, but uh, now the three headed Hydra, which uh, um, he uh, was pointing to, was the Hydra which had heads of delays, costs, and vexation. And effectively, we can really see that the legal systems, uh, and seemingly, well, English was one among the first to say it very loudly, but uh, uh, this has been the principal topic of reforms also in continental Europe and the principal problems in continental Europe. And therefore, fundamental debates in procedural law uh, were centered around these principal uh, problems. Now, where is the solution? Where to go? <coughs> well, we spoke a lot about um, truth, about systems. One solution which became popular as a way of phrasing the problem is, again, um, well, fundamentally English because it's connected to a word which is very difficult to uh, translate to some other languages. And this word is case management. So case management has actually become uh, a notion which has currently been discussed in a number of uh, places. I, and I most recently had an opportunity to go to Chile and speak about European uh, approach to case management, but that was the principal topic of a large Latin American conference. So what is case management? Just like the notion of truth, case management is also multifaceted and, uh, well, uh, ambiguous in its use. And I was searching for some way to explain this notion. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, browsing through my files, I found um, one where a good colleague of mine, sometimes knowledgeable colleague, Professor Van Rey, um, has explained to uh, students in Zagreb um, the notion of case management, because Netherlands was, uh, well, just uh, capturing this uh, wave of um, reforms and was among the first countries to, to actually uh, uh, also introduce techniques. And, and what did he say? What were, what, what were his words? So he said that case management is uh, describing a system of uh, rules of civil procedure which do not prescribe a uniform procedural framework for each and every case, but differentiate between different types of cases. And these are the rules uh, of civil procedure which have to leave the judge the necessary discretion to manage individual cases and the caseload as a whole. And this discretion can only be exercised to reach certain well-defined goals such as timeliness, moderate costs and efficiency. And finally, in order to make it work, courts have to be provided with adequate resources in order to create an environment where highly qualified court staff manage uh, cases efficiently. Uh, I could probably simplify this, this definition. It was a very learned uh, definition by simply saying that it is a system which prescribes good procedural rules for typical cases with sufficient discretion used for the common goals by a well-organized and competent uh, judiciary. Uh, now, my point here is not to enter in depth into this definition, but I want to uh, argue that case management nowadays has actually taken a systemic place in the uh, modern discussion, which was once upon held by other notions. And the two notions, which I'm in particular here going to uh, 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 address, are the notions of adversarial and inquisitorial systems. Nowadays, speaking about improving uh, the operation of the system of uh, justice, uh, it's very difficult to use, and what I'm going to submit to you, it is also misleading to use the notions of adversarial and uh, inquisitorial uh, system. So, while for some of you this might be an old news, uh, and 
in particular. I don't think that, that many people nowadays speak about desirable models, but still, I think it's relevant to know that adversarial and inquisitorial notions <laughs> are popping up every now and then in a way which is uh, not useful and they often get abused in order to promote particular agenda which are not necessarily in order uh, or in line with the good administration of uh, justice. Now, this criticism of adversarial and inquisitorial models is um, not a new one. In fact, another book published in 1985, The Faces of Justice and the State Authority, uh, the book by my fellow countryman, well, person from Zagreb, Professor Miriam Damaska, uh, argued at length that um, the inquisitorial adversarial divide is not appropriate as, as a model for even explaining uh, a legal system. So uh, what, what did he try to do? He made his own model based on a different uh, uh, division. Uh, and I will not go into details uh, here. I will focus here on debate which uh, uses ad adversarial and inquisitorial models as examples of desirable or not desirable models of contemporary judicial process. And essentially, my intention is to ask what model of judicial procedure uh, is uh, universally better from that perspective and show that this cannot be used as, as the uh, uh, real uh, 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 device. So, uh, the questions that I'm going to ask is, is the opposition between adversarial and inquisitorial models still useful as a tool for scholars and legislators? And I will address in particular two issues here, trying to test <coughs> possible ways uh, of how to evaluate these systems, the strengths and weaknesses of the systems, in terms that are compatible to what is now being recognized as the main problems in a judicial system, namely which of the two models is more efficient in terms of speed, costs and efforts, and which of the two models produces more accurate results. This is something that I uh, well, prefer over speaking about truth, but okay, we can speak also about the quality, quality of the uh, process. Uh, indeed, what we have to start with is to uh, look a little bit into the main features of this binary model that distinguishes uh, adversarial and inquisitorial processes. Because this has also been in uh, practical use rather uh, differently defined. So the adversarial process and inquisitorial process, at least how I understand them on the basis of a number of approaches, and I think this is, this is probably the simplest way to, to put it, is, uh, are defined by the idea about the role of the main participants in that process, being on one side the parties and their lawyers, and the other side the court or the judge. And the notion of adversarial process, as a pure model, assumes that in such a process we have a passive judge and active parties. How active? Well, very active. In a pure adversarial model, the masters of litigation, the domini litis, are uh, the parties. And this then transposes into technical uh, elements of the process. So, some of the most popular technical elements associated with an adversarial process are, for instance, uh, cross-examination or discovery or duty of mutual disclosure uh, in the fact-finding process. Also, in such a system, every element necessary for substantive adjudications or adjudication on the merits is uh, put to the court by the parties who also bear the burden for proving it, and this includes also the obligation to plead the law and also prove uh, the law of the case. Inquisitorial process, on the other hand side, is a process where you have a different distribution of roles. Uh, this is a process in which 
judges or the court are the act an active element, whereas the parties, in the end, may even become an, the object and not the subject of the proceedings. Uh, in such a process, there is an obligation to seek for true facts and applicable law on the side by the court, and the burden for these establishment is also on the side of uh, the court. We can see that in respect of all elements, not only proof, not only facts, but also the applicable law, uh, according to the uh, principle jura novit curia, or the judge knows the law, needs to be established uh, exclusively by the court. Uh, do we have pure models in reality? Well, historically, probably the closest matches to these uh, models of process were, on one hand side, the Roman canonical civil procedure, uh, the pr procedure which was prevailing up to the 19th century in, in, in Europe, and which was replaced later by different uh, uh, models of procedure. Inquisitorial process, on the other hand side, also is uh, difficult to find its, in its pure form, but for instance, socialist civil procedure uh, was getting very close to that model, and indeed, when we speak about criminal procedure, although I will show you uh, 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 in a moment that uh, it's, it's not uncontroversial, but according to this definition, it, was, it would be an uh, inquisitorial uh, process of an extreme kind. Uh, now, I would like to address some paradoxes of, that occur in such an understanding and distinction of uh, models. And I will start with some paradoxes, first some preliminary paradoxes. And, and, and this is uh, a paradox that, it's, uh, that, that occurs because it is virtually impossible to experimentally see what the effects of a particular system are, which one is more effective or which one is uh, more um, accurate because the perfect systems and models at present do not uh, exist. All the present systems are in a way a mixture of different elements and even the noted historical examples uh, uh, do depart from pure models in some essential aspects. Next, also preliminary paradox here, may be in the nature of self-understanding <coughs> of individual and national systems. Uh, as the historical discussion often associated inquisitorial processes to old, medieval, inefficient uh, system, it was rather unpopular to describe your own national system as an inquisitorial one. Therefore, it was a little bit refreshing to hear Paolo yesterday speaking about uh, his uh, national system as inquisitorial, which again is a frank uh, description and uh, probably more accurate one if we accept these definitions, but uh, not everybody was, is, was, is so frank. So for instance, uh, the principal uh, ideologist of the Soviet Russia, Andrei Yanuarevich Vyshinsky, the prosecutor in, in, in uh, uh, Stalinist uh, uh, cases, it was also a legal theorist. And uh, well, what he claimed against some other legal theorists it was very, very dangerous to be the uh, opponent of, of Vyshinsky because Vyshinsky, uh, when he was not satisfied with the, uh, the, the responses, um, usually followed with pragmatic action. And some of his principal discussions like uh, Stuchka and Pashukanis actually in the end um, didn't finish up uh, very nicely. So we should all be careful what we are saying as legal theories, because it may, even being a legal theorist may in some settings be a rather dangerous uh, uh, thing. But to get back to this, it's interesting that, that uh, Vyshinsky was arguing that Soviet uh, criminal process in, is in effect an adversarial one. And he said, it's much nicer to try uh, sentence and punish the enemies of the Soviet system in a public process where they are going to fight and where all our citizens will see who real enemy is of the system and this will have, have also a pronounced educational 
note and will help the citizens to bring forward further claims about uh, actions that are against uh, uh, national interests. So definitely, sometimes we have to distinguish what the system thinks about itself and how it is actually constructed. I can tell it from my own uh, well, student experience because the textbook of civil procedure uh, which I had to learn from and later also uh, examine students uh, argued that uh, Croatian or former Yugoslav civil procedure is dominantly adversarial civil procedure. Various on the other hand side well, according to the elements that we have already seen indeed no cross-examination some inquisitorial uh, uh, powers in finding facts, and the overall approach of procedure was a procedure in which uh, the parties were the passive element and the court had at least theoretically a passive role, uh, an active, very active role. And I will tell a little bit about that uh, uh, later. But um, these are just the preliminary paradoxes. There are further paradoxes linked to the understanding of effects of the two models and the direction of procedural uh, reforms. So uh, let us start with the two tests that I announced and this is what is the most efficient model of procedure. Is it inquisitorial or is it adversarial? And we will not have a um, doctrinal or theoretical text. We will see, test. We will see how systems reacted. So what we can uh, uh, note is that in the 2000s, in the past uh, um, two decades, there were two parallel developments and these two developments had the opposing direction. So on one hand side, in a number of Western European countries, starting with England and Wales, rules for reforms, for instance, in the area of civil procedure, but also then elsewhere, gradually, uh, the addressing of the principal problems speed, cost, vexation, uh, no, was uh, addressed by strengthening inquisitorial elements, by strengthening the activity of the court, strengthening the obligation of the court in the process. On the other side, in Eastern European countries, also Central European countries and Southern, uh, their way of uh, addressing legal reforms was going into Quite the other way, they aim to speed up trials by abolishing inquisitorial powers of uh, the judge. So, uh, for instance, um, uh, again, I will, I will just limit my remarks to, to the second model. There was a perception that the cause of efficiency, uh, inefficiency of the process is in two broad inquisitorial powers of the judge and that this then consequently uh, leads to changes uh, uh, that are necessary, it, uh, which in the end also resulted in removing uh, the powers that existed uh, before. I have uh, written about this phenomenon in a text under the title Omnipotent Judges as the Cause of Impotence and Inefficiency, where I described how this process was uh, was uh, advancing. Uh, but uh, let's go to the other test, and this is the test of accuracy, because here we are focusing on, on fact-finding and uh, evidence. Uh, what, is the, what, what model of process does guarantee better results? Uh, is inquisitorial style of proceedings more effective than adversarial, or vice versa, whether the adversarial is better than inquisitorial. Here, too, we can note in the past two decades two parallel developments that go in different uh, uh, direction. For instance, common law countries still believe, that, or at least, well, I will see by uh, your reactions whether it is the case, but believe that adversarial techniques, especially cross-examination, are vital for truth finding of accuracy of the process. And on the other side, continental doctrine believes that 
some ex officio powers and active involvement of judges in taking of evidence are the necessary precondition of uh, accuracy. Uh, we can find various examples for these positions. So, for instance, uh, well, first the traditional view you all know about uh, Wigmore's statement about uh, cross-examination -exam being the greatest legal engine ever invented for discovery of um, truth. And, well, whole books were written about that. Uh, Cox, for instance, stated that cross-examination is the rarest, the most useful, and the most difficult to be acquired of all accomplishments of the advocate because it has always been deemed the surest test of truth and the better scrutiny than the oath, traditional position. But interestingly, that's not just a historical position. Uh, in his uh, speech uh, delivered last year in Girona, Zuckerman argued that adversarial process is the only guarantee of integrity of a judicial process. And his position was that uh, this is structurally a precondition for accurate fact-finding. And uh, uh, argument that he advanced was that uh, inquisitorial system has inbuilt biases, especially the confirmation bias, which cannot actually lead to accurate results. So, well, uh, is this the case? Maybe there is some truth in this statement, uh, but um, there are completely different views on accuracy of adversarial systems, and indeed uh, we in continental Europe tend to think that our systems are superior, but I'm referring to a uh, important and um, often cited uh, text by a American law professor from Yale, John Langbein, who argued in his uh, uh, famous paper on the German advantage in civil procedure that German civil procedure with all its features is very superior to adversarial system which is distorting evidence, which is expensive, and which is very far from uh, actual ideal truth finding. So German model uh, with its moderated, uh, uh, balanced way with uh, its um, uh, approach uh, that enables judges to moderate the zealousness of the advocates, according to Langbein, uh, is, in this sense, very superior. Let me get back to Zuckerman's argument about uh, cognitive biases. Uh, so what is what the science says today? Indeed, uh, the cognitive uh, biases do exist, and they exist in the form of confirmation bias, but not only in that form. This is just a list of some of the forms of biases that, we, that, you, can, that you can find in uh, everyday discourse, but also in judicial decision making. Ego depletion, uh, the uh, phenomenon that uh, uh, the uh, uh, thorough analytical uh, decision making actually takes glucose out of, out of our brain and therefore requires more power and therefore uh, is something that is um, uh, in uh, reasoning uh, easily replaced by cognitive cues as, 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 as stated by simple making on the basis of assumptions that are sometimes true and sometimes not. Anchoring effect. Uh, when decision maker is uh, uh, in doubt and he has even a random figure uh, that is uh, put to his attention, that random figure is affecting his decision making. Hindsight wise, if something has happened, then you are more likely to believe that it was probable that it would happen and this then affects your evaluation of uh, past behavior, which is very often in law. And of course, egocentric bias, uh, which uh, uh, is a bias uh, natural in all decision makers. We all think that we are 
above average in our capacities and superior in our, in our uh, ability to uh, draw conclusions. Anyway, uh, what we can conclude is that juridical and judicial decision making is in fact in all models of procedure less rational and deductive than assumed in con conventional textbooks of I think both criminal and, and civil procedure. Uh, what judges are often applying are cognitive shortcuts, rules of thumb, and this has been confirmed by concrete empirical evidence uh, in the research that uh, has tested whether judges also suffer from all series of biases uh, that are listed here. So therefore, cognitive biases do exist and play a role irrespective of the model of judicial process, whether it's, a, it's an adversarial or inquisitorial uh, model. Uh, so my submission is to, uh, that it is wrong to associate particular quality to a particular model and use inquisitorial and adversarial notions in a kind of beauty contest between uh, legal systems. What we instead need to do uh, is to focus on the model that divides procedures and uh, see also whether this uh, uh, model is still useful or it has to be replaced by something else. Um, there are two assumptions on which uh, this division of adversarial and inquisitorial processes are rooted and I would submit that both are fundamentally false. First, it is that passive and active uh, behavior or uh, passive and active uh, action in the process of the judge and the parties is a kind of a zero-sum game. Or, to be very uh, clear, passive judges necessarily imply that parties are active, or on the other side, active judges assume that parties are passive. What we have here is a kind of a seesaw. And I would say that this view is fundamentally wrong. Uh, the second assumption is that in respect to processing of procedural material, the judges and parties are bound to be uh, either passive or active in respect to <coughs> the same issues. And what uh, uh, that assumes is that the, part of the behavior and the powers of the court and judges regarding the uh, obligation to find facts when we speak about evidence, ex officio is necessarily then combined with judicial activism in the conduct of the process. And this is another assumption which I hold to be wrong. I'll give some, some examples. Uh, first, let me start with the second assumption. Uh, we have models of hope. Oh, actual civil, pro uh, civil procedural processes where you have both passive court and passive, passive parties. And I will uh, tell you uh, where we can see that. But um, uh, the activity and passivity also has to be seen in particular when it comes to uh, the uh, way of case management, or type of case management, and here case management can be divided into substantive and formal case management. And uh, substantive and formal case management are directed towards different objectives. Uh, the substantive case management uh, includes the steps undertaken in order to define uh, facts relevant to the determination of the dispute, to identify and present evidence necessary for the a proper determination of the facts to determine applicable rules of law and to identify and apply other rules necessary for decision making on the merits of the case. So these are all actions directly uh, relevant for uh, substantive uh, decision making. Whereas formal case management uh, defines the formal uh, conduct of the proceedings. These are the steps undertaken and here we have a number of things uh, listed setting procedural calendars, scheduling uh, uh, meetings and conferences with the parties, setting deadlines, determining the type of procedure, and so on. In 
respect, even when it only comes to evidence and, and facts, uh, the division of labor here exists uh, between the court and the parties, uh, but not in a way that one is responsible for everything and the other uh, is passive, but here, instead of active and passive uh, uh, behavior, uh, it is a functional uh, division of labor where both parties and the court are uh, active in a certain uh, way. Now, uh, most reforms with respect to formal case management uh, today try to emphasize the active role of the court. So even in the adversarial systems, nowadays uh, you have the strong uh, movement towards uh, uh, increasing the obligations of the court to uh, conduct and control the proceedings. Um, let me now go into another issue, and this is whether we have further empirical support for advantages of adversarial or inquisitorial systems. And here I will uh, uh, assume together with you, that if a adversarial system is superior, then um, it should also be uh, reflected in the opinion of the users of particular uh, system. Interestingly, today we have sufficient empirical information about what citizens and businesses think about their systems of justice. So, for instance, uh, in the European Union, we can trace the opinion of the users in the uh, document that is called the EU Justice Scoreboard, and which is published now two or three years ago, well, since 2016, um, on the annual basis. And a number of facts and figures uh, are uh, collected in such a document. One figure is in particular relevant for us, and this is the uh, indication of the public trust in the judiciary. This is, for instance, the results of the, of the survey uh, of um, uh, public in respect to whether the public holds courts and judges uh, to be independent or not. And I would say that this is also uh, the indicator of rea reliability and the public trust into, into particular national systems. What can we see in this slide? Well, what we can see is that in over half of the EU countries, a half or more of population do not trust the independence of uh, judiciary. Where do we have high trust and where do we have a low trust in judiciary? What we see here, for instance, is that uh, the highest trust uh, in Europe is in Denmark. Denmark, Finland and Austria hold the first three places. And this is indicated by this blue column, which uh, uh, reflects the responses to the question whether you hold that independence, of course, in judges is uh, good or bad. So blue means very good or fairly good. And here, consistently in last years, Denmark and Finland, the public trust, well, in Denmark is almost 90%, and Finland over 80%. Similarly, also in Austria, Sweden. And then we have Ireland, Germany, Netherlands, Luxembourg, United Kingdom, Belgium, and Cyprus. What do we have on the other side? Well, the thing that I'm not proud of is that my country is at the very best. At the very end, Croatia has the lowest uh, perceived trust in judiciary, which is shown by this uh, column here, which is also unfortunately decreasing from year to year. And this shows that currently about, uh, well, almost 80% of, of population do not trust the independence, uh, or I would say also uh, judiciary, uh, as do not appreciate judiciary as such. What are the other countries? Uh, Croatia, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Estonia, Italy, Poland, Slovenia, Romania, Portugal, 
Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, Czech, Czech Republic. Um, oh, sorry, this was Spain, and then this is and this is Estonia. EE is Estonia, uh, Malta, uh, Greece, and France. Um, can we draw any conclusions from from this op public opinion uh, on legal systems as to which system is better, an adversarial or inquisitorial one. Even in a very moderate way, if we assume that, that some systems are more adversarial and more, or more inquisitorial the, than the other systems. And I would say that it's hardly the case. Well, first of all, some of the most adversarial ones are at best here in the middle, Austria, well, Austria is hardly an example, at least in civil procedure, of a radical adversarial system. It is true that what we have here on this side is a number of um, Eastern and Southern European systems which used to be rather inquisitorial. But interestingly, what was happening in the, in the recent past is that uh, uh, these traditional inquisitorial systems uh, have undertaken reforms which have swung them completely into the other camp. So very radical adversarial models, at least when we speak about uh, civil procedure. So I don't think that we have any good empirical evidence here about this. And spe specifically when it comes to the experience of uh, post-socialist development, uh, uh, you know, that the Berlin Wall uh, fell in the beginning of the 90s, and uh, we have already two decades after that. Uh, however, uh, the Soviet uh, the traces of Soviet doctrine are still uh, visible. What was the basis of the uh, or the ideological base of inquisitorialism in the uh, socialist uh, countries? Again, <coughs> we start with the fundamental ideological uh, or philosophical rule is correspondence <coughs> theory of truth that we already referred to. And what does it mean? Correspondence with the outside reality is the ultimate uh, criterion of accuracy. You have the objective reality which is existing outside of the proceedings. Uh, it's very important and actually most important to come to conclusions which are complying to that outside reality. There is a supremacy of truth as the values in judicial process. It is the pinnacle in the hierarchy of procedural principles. And therefore, the overarching goal of every judicial process is material truth. That is the materielle Wahrheit in, in, in German, which it, at least in, in Germany and Austria, uh, was used in a different context in the debate of uh, uh, legal and free systems of evaluation of, of evidence. But here it means a correspondence to the objective truth. So the aim of the process is to mirror the reality and the reality as, as, as such ideologically construed. The ultimate criterion is transprocedural truth which exists outside of the courtroom. Political underpinning is clear. You need to have a process which is instrumental to the goals of the system. Therefore, formal law and uh, formal criteria, legal truth, they all have to be decomposed. Material truth should be the alibi for purging the court proceedings of all harmful er and unnecessary formalism. This is a citation from, again, one of the textbooks according to which I learned uh, my, um, at my law school. Uh, judicial process needs to have an educational role, therefore. Uh, it has to manage relationships of uh, parties without uh, unnecessary Mediators. So, for instance, lawyers, as such, is, in fact, any private influence and element uh, is 
not viewed as desirable. Therefore, uh, the parties need to submit their case to the court, which is then have, uh, evaluated uh, by uh, um, the criteria of, again, traditional here, free evaluation of evidence, but free evaluation of evidence was the evidence, uh, again, citation based on class instincts, socialist consciousness, dialectic materialism, and democratic centralism. Therefore, uh, the state needs to intervene in all elements of, uh, of the process, in all legal relations, and insofar, even Lenin was arguing that there is no difference between private law and public law. In the socialist law, all the law is public because it has public consequences. And the ultimate arbiter is the political convenience, the opinion of the ruling elites in uh, the socialist uh, uh, period, it was the ruling party. Now, what is the experience after this uh, development? So, uh, how to put it in terms of inquisitorial and adversarial? So, as we have seen, in the socialist period, we had uh, a paternalistic, inquisitorial attitude towards the process. Uh, the activity seems to be ideologically assigned only to the court, whereas the parties were supposed to be passive. And uh, the ideological uh, objectives were also imposed on the, on the court, and they were regarded to be much more important than individual uh, right. And especially, it was more important to reach the truth than to reach a result within a reasonable time or any time at all. And therefore, what is turned into practice is that such inquisitorial process effectively was a process of reactive nature. Uh, collection of evidence was the ultimate responsibility of the court. The burden of proof on the parties was virtually lifted and eliminated. And um, because the truth was so important, uh, there was lack of any uh, limitation in the process. The preclusions did not play any role, so whatever was raised, even if it was raised knowingly only in the late stages of, of proceedings, had to be considered by the court, because the court had to establish the truth. Even uh, facts raised on appeal had to be evaluated, well, even the facts which were uh, abusively raised only at appeal had to be taken into account. Therefore, the res judicata effect was uh, uh, construed, again, I'm not speaking about, about uh, uh, some moderate systems like Yugoslav was rather moderate, but in, in for instance, even now in in China, uh, res judicata virtually does not exist because the parties can always reopen the procedure uh, asking to have it uh, re-examined in the light of new facts. We can see here how effectively very scientific uh, Chinese civil procedure is because in science, as we all know, there is no ultimate deadline for finding the truth and therefore, well, also in Chinese procedure, there is no such ultimate deadline. But what is the consequence in practice? We have a model of process where we have passive court and passive judges because, uh, well, although there was a, a ideological urge to uh, collect material, the judges were, in fact, uh, not uh, really armed with adequate uh, tools, just like in any other process. Even judges were uh, under strict uh, ideological uh, control, and their interest into finding uh, the facts, into collecting material, uh, was, from their own natural uh, perspective, uh, very low. Because if you find all facts, you have to make a decision. And decision may be unfavorable to somebody who is in charge of defining what objective truth is. 
somebody who is staying outside of procedure. So therefore, it's much better to lead the procedure reactively, collect material with huge delays, and this is in fact what happens, massive inefficiency, delays, and backlogs. Uh, was it the more truthful system? Definitely not, because well, if you need about five or ten years in the first instance to come to the judgment, which may then be reviewed on appeal and then eventually in a couple of decades you will have another review. For the sheer passage of time, you will have less and less possibilities to, to find what really happened. Interestingly, in the post-socialist period, uh, we have again a completely opposite situation but with the same consequences. Uh, especially in the countries where it was very clear, like Hungary or Poland, uh, instantly in the 90s, the first reform said, we don't want to be inquisitorial anymore. We want to be very adversarial. And what did it mean uh, in uh, the context of civil procedure? How it was understood, and it was actually misconceived in, in a way. Namely, uh, the new goal in the procedure was not anymore to establish material, but legal truth. And that became the main uh, slogan of the procedural reforms. We don't have to search for uh, factual truth, we have to find what party's truth is in the process. And in order to facilitate that, strict deadlines have been imposed for presentation of facts and introduction of evidence, and if these strict deadlines were not observed, the consequence was that a fact or uh, a piece of proof could not be considered or taken anymore, no matter whether it's relevant, important or not. And the court, in this sense, had very little discretion to allow it, and frankly didn't care because it was much more elegant and, and com comfortable for the court just to, well, say this is the party's truth, you haven't raised a fact in due time, Therefore, sorry. Adversarial evidence taking was uh, uh, therefore again turned into another reactive process. What happened was, uh, well, if we exaggerate a little bit, was returned back to the 18th century, beginning of 9th century, where uh, again a very adversarial procedure resulted in the necessity of the parties to uh, plead all the possible, even hypothetically possible facts at the very beginning. And therefore, they had also to accumulate uh, their assertions under the uh, uh, procedural principle, which was in Germany called eventual maxime, uh, stating, for instance, uh, Yes, uh, we never concluded a contract with the other party, but if we concluded that contract, this contract is invalid uh, because we never, uh, we never saw that uh, party. But if we did see that party, we never met on that date. And if we met on that date, we never considered this fact. So, effectively, uh, with the reintroduction of uh, this uh, accumulation, the consequence was that uh, a lot of unnecessary material started to uh, uh, enter the uh, court dockets. Consequence finally was that the courts and parties were overburdened, uh, a lot of appeals and further inefficiency. Again, accuracy is hardly to be evaluated as high. So what should be a modern approach to civil procedure then? And now I will speed up because I think my time is... No more or less over. Uh, the project in which, which Remco and I participated in the last five years tried to phrase this uh, modern approach. And it, it was a project based on uh, a document uh, that uh, already in the uh, beginning of 2000s was produced by American Law Institute and UNIDRA, document called Principles of Transnational Civil Procedure. And some of you might, may know this uh, 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 document 
several scholars for di from different systems participated in that project. Uh, some of the most uh, uh, visible ones were Professor Jeffrey Hazard uh, on the American side and Michele Tarufo and uh, Rolf Stürner uh, from German and Italian side. Later also Antonio Giri from, from Brazil. And, well, for us, is it in a particular important uh, um, the uh, Rule 11, which was supposed to define the obligation of the parties and lawyers. Uh, but uh, this rule is relatively short, and the, the whole set of rules, uh, and in fact called principles, were rather general. So a new project was initiated in 2013 by European Law Institute, again in collaboration with UNIDRA, where these principles had to be converted in a, a more comprehensive document which could even be used as model legislation, the example of best practices uh, uh, for uh, Europe. And uh, this project was supposed to be the follow-up to the original ALI and UNIDRA uh, project. Now, uh, the project of uh, European Law Institute was uh, in its participation much more comprehensive, M more people participated, there were uh, a lot of uh, working groups, I think nine or ten, Remco, uh, ten, ten working groups, but uh, the one relevant for, for us today is the working group on obligations of parties and lawyers, and that was the group that Remco and I had the uh, uh, honor of chairing as co-reporters. So what we started with was the Rule 11, and I will cite our introductory um, explanation of what we uh, finally produced. Well, we wanted to produce rules uh, which create a modern approach to civil litigation in that they put the emphasis on loyal cooperation between the judge, the parties, and the lawyers um, creating the models where all of them have a shared responsibility in putting an end to dispute. And this means that adversarial inquisitorial divide is intentionally avoided since the underlying idea is the rules of the rules is that there is no mutually exclusive division of labor between the various participants in a civil lawsuit. They are only shared obligations. Now, what we see here is a model of procedure where we don't have any more active parties, passive court. Passive court, active parties, but a model in which all participants, parties, their lawyers, and the court are active. And thereby, this old conundrum of adversarial process and inquisitorial process is uh, replaced by one sole procedural principle, the principle of loyal cooperation. In the latest variant of this text, which is supposed to be finalized uh, in, next, in the May next year, we have the Rule 2, general rule, which states exactly this. Parties, their lawyers, and the courts must cooperate in order to promote fair, efficient, and speedy resolution of the dispute. Uh, I will more or less stop here just by uh, drawing a couple of uh, conclusions. First, I'd like to show you some of the rules uh, which were later produced in the context of evidence. Um, for instance, the general obligations of parties, lawyers, and the court are listed in the preliminary part, uh, listing uh, the obligations of uh, the parties as in, in, in all um, uh, segments of the process, but also on the other side mirrored by the shared obligation of the court. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read and analyze this. Maybe you're also interested in the rules on facts, uh, evidence, and applicable law, where we also have in the end variant the text where 
the uh, model of procedure is neither adversarial nor inquisitorial according to the definition which we have given. So indeed there is a joint and shared uh, responsibility here. The court uh, will generally support the facts from which were advanced by the parties. Uh, it must not consider facts not introduced by the parties, but it may consider such facts that are not specifically addressed if they are necessarily implied. Uh, it may only do so if relevant parties claim uh, uh, or defense, uh, if, if uh, they are relevant to a party's claim or defense and the parties have been given a reasonable opportunity to respond. Uh, so there are also uh, safeguards built into it. And again, when it comes to evidence, the right of uh, the parties, well, parties are in the, in the forefront, but the uh, uh, court also has exceptionally a possibility to take evidence on its own motion. Now, conclusions. Uh, maybe it will be difficult to uh, avoid binary principles, but um, they may be used with, uh, as, as heuristic tools. They may have some heuristic value, but when it's used as a recipe for phrasing the procedure, for framing the process, uh, they give misleading signals to lawmakers and practitioners. Uh, adversarial and inquisitorial principles in particular, if they are used as directive principles, cannot provide adequate guidance anymore and therefore uh, I would uh, suggest to, uh, well, at least uh, reduce the use of the notions uh, to its bare minimum as heuristic uh, tools. And modern scholarship of uh, judicial process, both civil and, and criminal, should phrase new directive approach to procedural principles with a single fundamental principle where activity of all participants is secured. So to show it in, in a uh, well, visual way, the procedural obligations today have to be shared among all participants. The content of the obligation is well, the duty of uh, loyal cooperation, but uh, it uh, creates a process in which values fundamental values are shared, and these fundamental <coughs> values of the process are fairness, efficiency, and speed. The methods that have to be used are, well, currently proportionality has come into forefront together with the duty, pre-procedural duty of the participants in the process to undertake all steps uh, that can reduce the disputes or that can clarify particular issues in the pre-trial state and therefore uh, even before initiating uh, uh, litigation there should be a necessity of exchange of information but also claims and necessity of the use of uh, all available means including alternative dispute resolution. And then the conventional procedural principles like orality, writing, publicity, language, assistance, and so on, they are only tools, they are only instruments, and all that together is effectively phrasing the ambit of case uh, management. So that's more or less what I wanted to argue. Thank you very much for your attention, and indeed I'm very open to your uh, questions.